Evening, friends and colleagues, and welcome to the final uh, virtual BOFAS Journal Club for the current BOFAS year. Um, my name is James Ritchie. I'll be moderating the session along with my colleague, Sarah Johnson Lynn. I'd like to thank in advance our senior panelists, Joseph L. Suzu and Tim Clough, um, as well as Togai Cock for running the IT and the fellows presenting, Jamie Barnett and Anil Halder. Today's topic is the gritty question of the role of PRP in foot and ankle surgery. Uh, is it a panacea? Is it placebo? Will it perhaps revolutionize foot and ankle treatments in the 21st century? Or does it only work if it's harvested by the song of a mermaid and administered by the light of a full moon following sacrifice of a white cockerel? We may not know the definitive answers, but hopefully by the end of this evening's session, we'll be better informed. Um, we have two papers to be presented, the first from Tim Clough's unit on platelet-rich plasma in uh, 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 plantar fasciitis, and secondly, the PATH2 trial on PRP in Achilles ruptures. The um, format will be the same as usual. We will have the fellow presentation for the first paper, then the senior author, Tim will reflect upon it, and then we'll take some questions and uh, hopefully find some answers for you. I'd encourage everyone to submit any questions that you like, please, via the Q&A function um, on your browser there. The, uh, there is no question too foolish, and a prize will be given at the end of the evening for the most outrageous uh, question. There are a few other bits of housekeeping. Um, at the end of the session, uh, we will show a QR code, which will take you to the feedback form, which we need you to complete in order to obtain uh, your certificates of attendance. Um, we will also need to show you a numerical code to put into that form, and that will be put on the chat at the end of the session. So <clears throat> without further ado, um, I'd like to get on with the uh, first session. And uh, in particular, we'll hear a presentation on Tim Clough's paper on PRP in uh, versus corticosteroids in plantar fasciitis by Jamie Barnett, uh, the uh, fellow stump. Good evening. My name is Jamie Barnett, and I'm one of the registrars currently working at the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital. Today, I'll be speaking about platelet rich plasma versus corticosteroid injection for plantar fasciitis, a, a comparative study. And this is by Kaushik Jane. Philip Murphy and Tim Clough. The article was published in The Foot. This is an internationally reviewed journal, uh, Medline indexed an impact factor at 1.317, and it's affiliated with BOFAS. Uh, there's no funding received uh, externally for the study. In terms of the background, plantar fasciitis is one of the most common causes of heel pain, and it's thought to be due to microscopic degenerative injuries, which lead to local disruption of the collagen matrix and micro tears. The treatment can be either conservative or surgical, and the and non-operative is with rest, heel cups, eccentric stretching exercises, night splints, NSAIDs, and immobilization. And where the symptoms are intractable, there's options for corticosteroid injections, platelet-rich plasma, and shockwave therapy. In terms of the operative side, this is rarely done as uh, the efficacy is variable um, and it involves releasing the plantar fascia. PRP or platelet-rich plasma is derived from taking a sample of whole blood from the patient. It's centrifuged in order to, to obtain a highly concentrated sample. And it looks a bit like this picture on the right. Um, it's thought to stimulate the natural healing process through growth factors that relief, release such as platelet-derived growth factor, TGF-beta, FGF, and insulin-like growth factor. In terms of the aims of this study, it was to compare autologous platelet-rich plasma to cortisone injections for the treatment of chronic cases of plantar fasciitis, and this was at, uh, at 3, 6, and 12 months. The methods they used, it was a single center study. The inclusion criteria were patients who had intractable plantar fasciitis, and this is where they did not respond to cushioned insoles, um, a full course of eccentric stretching exercises and, phys and physiotherapy. And they had to have at least 12 months of symptoms. They recruited 60 um, heels in 46 patients and patients were randomized into one of two treatment arms of either PRP or steroid injection. They assessed 
the patients uh, pre-treatment at three, six, and 12 months post-injection, and they use three scores, the rolls Morsley score, visual analog score, and the AO, FAS, ankle, and hind foot score. And they also documented any complications. The steroids they used was uh, Kenalog 40 milligrams and Levobupivacaine. And in terms of the PRP, they used a Biomet Biologics GPS-3 system and withdrew 27 mils of blood, which was sensed fused, and then uh, 2.5 mils of PRP was available. And they injected the PRP or, and the steroid into the areas of maximal tenderness at the heel in the operating theatre. And they used a peppering technique to do this. And patients were advised to continue the eccentric stretching program and cushions insoles after the uh, injections were done. In terms of their results, they had um, the, the, mean, the age range was 31 to 79 years with a mean of 55.6 years. 14 patients had bilateral treatments. Six of these were in the PRP group and eight of these were in the steroid group. They didn't find any significant differences in terms of the patient demographics, such as age or gender between the groups. And pre-treatment, they didn't find any difference in the measures, uh, in the uh, outcome measures of pain and function um, for, for any of those measures that they looked at. Postoperatively, um, looking in the both treatments arms, all three outcome measures showed a statistically significant improvement in pain and function scores at all time points, regardless of treatment. And this table here shows that um, there, there was no, that, that they all showed a significant improvement at three, six, and 12 months for all those three RMS, VAS, and AO fast scoring. In terms of um, looking between two groups, so we're looking at separately at PR or comparing PRP and steroid injections, they didn't find any difference between the two groups at three and six months. But at 12 months, there was a significant improvement in all three measures for the PRP treatment group. And this graph, or this, uh, these graphs on the right show that the PRP group in the blue, it shows a more consistent result for both the VAS score and the RM score compared to steroid, where the effects start to taper off and back towards the, um, the pre-treatment levels. The, um, the uh, eight, 18 of the patients in the PRP group, that 60%, were found to have complete or almost complete resolution of their symptoms at one year. Uh, with an AO fast score of more than or equal to 90. And this compared to the steroid group, where only 10 patients, that's 33%, had an AO fast score of more than 90 at one year. And they didn't record any complications in either group. Um, in terms of this discussion, um, this paper looked at 60 patients using three outcome scores at three time points, three, six, and 12 months post-injections. And they showed that the efficacy of the PRP injection remained at one year, unlike steroid injection, which started to taper off after six months. Uh, and, and, when, and comparing to other studies, Shetty et al um, is one study that they discussed and they looked at the three month time point in 60 patients and they found that the uh, AOFAS, VAS and foot and ankle disability index were all significantly better in the PRP group at three months, although they didn't do any further time points. Um, Say et al reviewed 50 patients and they found that the VAS and AOFAS scores were significantly better at six weeks and six months in the PRP group versus steroids, although there were also no further time points available. Uh, Axin et al. reviewed 60 patients and found no statistical significance between the, the groups at three weeks and six months. And again, they also had no other time points. And uh, Monto et al. looked at 40 patients, um, randomized to either PRP or steroid, and they showed a benefit for PR, PRP, and that remained at 24 months um, post the injection. So in conclusion, PRP is as effective as steroid at achieving symptom relief um, at three and six months, and its effects do not wear off at 12 months. And it's as more effective and durable than Corsone as a treatment option. And that was their final conclusions. And in terms of limitations of the study, it was performed in a single center. Ultrasound guidance wasn't used, and this may allow for increased accuracy of the injection placement. And only 12 months of follow-up was looked at, although this is more than many of the other studies, but further longer term results may be um, useful to, to also see how they do in the, in the longer term. And comparison with other treatments such as shock wave therapy would also be another useful thing to look at. Um, so um, in summary, this is a prospective randomized control study, and it's very useful to help guide treatment for intractable causes of plantar fasciitis. And it is an expensive option, but longer term efficacy may justify the cost of this. 
Thank you very much. Well, my thanks to uh, James Barnett for putting that presentation together. And I apologize to uh, everyone attending for our difficulties with the sound during that presentation. Um, can I ask Tim Clough, the senior author of that paper, who I'm sure is known to everyone in BOFAS, uh, not least as the master of the fantastic Silastic, to uh, give us a short summary of the paper to clarify the bits that we lost uh, in the poor sound transmission. And then we'll uh, ask for his reflections on his further thoughts on the subject and um, anything he might have done differently in the study. Over to you, Tim. Okay, thanks very much for um, inviting me to uh, discuss the paper. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is highlight the co-authors of the paper. Uh, Kaushik Jain, who did a lot of the bulwark uh, and helped to write it up. I'd also like to thank the um, clinicians uh, who were there at the time, particularly Tariq Kareem, who helped to recruit a lot of the patients. So this study, well, okay, so it's not a massively great Lancet scientific paper, so it can be criticised amongst many levels. But the study is an open and honest study of a clinical problem that we see a lot of in the clinics and you scratch your head. So criticisms, we did not perform a pre-study power calculation. So we've no real idea as to how many we actually needed. But we did look at trying to um, uh, randomize them and we prospectively collected data. So when we were designing the study, we looked at what was out there in the literature. And at the time, there wasn't very much. There were some poor quality papers about PRP and we probably still don't know how um, it works if it really does work. Um, we used a commercially viable system which from the literature the reason we chose that is that from the literature studies concentrates the prp and the platelets to a greater level than any of the other commercially viable um, options at the time so that's what we decided to use um aofas is not a uh proven outcome score for plantar fasciitis, but AOFAS was at the time a widely um, uh, used uh, patient reported outcome marker for a plethora of a variety of foot and ankle problems. So we use that, we use VAS because it's easily uh, identifiable and we use the rolls Maudley score because that was the one that was uh, actually um, proven for plantar fasciitis. Uh, and basically, we just started pr prospectively collecting the data. Studies had taken it out to six months. So we know steroid works. We know it probably works in about 60% of cases. And we know that there's a relapse rate with steroid. And if it relapses, it's usually around about the six month mark. So the aim was that we wanted to take the outcome beyond six months, which had only been published up to then, and try and work out what the relapse rate of uh, steroid was. Um, so that's what we kind of found in the studies. So the first important factor when we started looking at the data was that they both seemed to work at an even an equal level between three and six months. Um, steroid works quickly. PRP is a slow burn. So if we'd have probably analysed them at two weeks, steroid would have higher response rate at two weeks. So PRP seems to kick in slow from around two weeks and the efficacy starts to come in probably at around two months. So our first data collection point was three months, which showed no difference at that level. Um, then we looked at the six months and again, no real difference. So 
the points that we highlight in the paper, which weren't really known at that stage, were PRP seems to work, seems to work around the same level as a steroid, bearing in mind these are patients that had had most non-operative management beforehand. At the time that we were doing this study, we didn't have any access to um, shockwave therapy. We do now have the shockwave machine. It would be nice to um, repeat this study with a power calculation and look at steroid versus PRP versus shockwave, probably 50 in each group. I have no idea on the power calculation. And that would be neat to do if anybody's looking for a paper uh, or anybody's looking at a project to do. Um, and so the, the other thing that we did uh, find is that its outcome, which was a surprise to us, was that its outcome was um, maintained out to 12 months where steroid um, kind of dropped off. So really where we're at with this was we still use PRP because of this. We still use it for plantar fasciitis, so don't use it across other areas, uh, in particular, I don't use it for uh, Achilles tendinopathy because I don't like injecting anything in and around an Achilles tendon in case it ruptures. What we did find was that we had no plantar fascial ruptures with PRP. We didn't have any plantar fascial ruptures with steroid, but we do see those from time to time. We continue to use PRP on the back of that. And um, as far as I'm aware, I have not had a PRP plantar fascial rupture with its use. So really, that's all I've got to say about it. It's a clinic. It was really a clinical outcome study on a common condition where you faced in um, clinic where you're scratching your head if you don't have outcome to other treatment regimes. Tim, thank, thanks very much for um, sharing those re reflections, which were brutally honest, as I would indeed uh, expect from you on, on all occasions. Um, the A few questions have come in. Um, one, were the injections guided? I, I think the answer is no to that. Is that correct? So the injections weren't guided. Um, we, we mentioned that in the paper. So there's a lot of radiologists and there's a lot of literature to say that ultrasound guided injections are better if you look at the, most of those most of those are by radiologists who don't know where they're injecting we counteracted in the paper the reason why we didn't do it a it was it was just too difficult to coordinate because the radiologists didn't want to harvest the prp so getting them into clinic to do an ultrasound guided and for me to look at an ultrasound machine i might as well look at you know the subsurface of the moon it means nothing to me so the we did find a paper that uh, showed that um there was no difference between uh, uh, uh ultrasound guided injection and injection at the point of maximal uh, tenderness so i i don't do any of my plantar fascial injections ever under ultrasound guidance okay um, further question, um, how many injections and at what intervals? And I suppose in a way, uh, further to the previous question, where do you in exactly inject? So, so the diagnosis is often a clinical diagnosis. So you, 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 it's an easy diagnosis to make. And you tend to find that the pain is in one of two sites. It's either at the classical, under the heel, at the proximal plantar fascial insertion, but it's often and more commonly on the medial heel ridge. So I inject at the point of maximal plantar tenderness. So there's a million and one ways to skin the cat. The way that I inject is I just go straight for it. I don't come in from the side. I go straight through the, the sole of the foot, right down to bone. And you can feel the grit, the gritty layer that you go through before you hit bone. I go straight down to bone and then pull back. Uh, and you can feel that you're injecting into that gritty layer. And then you pepper pot the gritty layer uh, with the injection. It's two and a half mils. So the important thing with PRP is it's not a pleasant injection. 
You can't use local because it in, is said to inactivate the platelets. That's where we were at that time. There is increasing evidence to say you might be able to use local. Uh, now, further evidence has come out in the last couple of years. I still don't use local. We did use local with the uh, steroid, the okay. usual way. And it was just one injection? It's just a single injection. And did you have to strap the patients down for this extraordinarily painful experience? No, uh, they're made from um, tough stuff up north. <laughs> I'm sure they are. Um, further question, uh, is there a difference between autologous conditioned plasma, ACP, and PRP injection? Yes, absolutely there is. So our nurses get confused, and all that confusion is brought about by the bloody knee surgeons who use ACP to inject NEOA. So Arthrex um, is a company that make ACP. Uh, they have their machinery. And basically, that's the top buffy layer of the plasma. So that is it. So that so what we are injecting is so you discard the plasma, which is e effectively leukocyte poor PRP. So that's the buffy layer. And really, that's what you inject for OA. So that's beloved of our knee surgeons they'll spin that off and inject that for, for OA knee. Whereas what we're injecting is that what looks like red tomato juice, which is leukocyte rich PRP. And that's so leukocyte rich is what you should inject for tendinopathies or soft tissue insertional problems like for tendon, uh, for tennis elbow, leukocyte poor, which is a buffy layer, which is the plasma layer, is what you inject for OA. Okay, thank you. I think that's, that's really helpful, actually, to clear everyone's confusion up. Um, supplementary to that, uh, from Miguel Fernandez, do we know if there is an optimum concentration of PRP for this condition? Uh, no. So there's a, the, the, there is, um, you know, uh, a lot of companies making PRP equipment. So when we were looking at it, there was a couple of studies that looked across then the companies that were making them. I think there were five at that stage. And they basically uh, sent them off and analyzed how many platelets were in, what the concentration was over whole blood um uh, uh across the across the spectrum and so this uh, this one i think was somewhere between four and eight times whole blood concentration of prp which was the most concentrated so i we went for that on the basis that the more platelets you concentrate it may well be better so you were going that's for, what we're after yeah you were going for more is more yes more is more OK, uh, jolly good. Um, uh, interesting question, which can't be part of your study, but did you think about doing PRP and corticosteroids as simultaneous injections? Well, I'm not sure why I would. I mean, corticosteroids is an anti-inflammatory. Uh, this is um, uh, leukocyte rich. It's a pro-inflammatory. So it's, you know, which it, it's two different uh, mutually exclusive approaches to possibly answer the same problem. You know, there's a whole debate on, you know, really, this is a degenerate problem. So does steroid work in any event? If it does, how is it working? So PRP doesn't go with steroid because one's pro-inflammatory and one's anti-inflammatory. Yeah, indeed. So it's one or the other. Absolutely. I, well, I think we're going to draw to a close in a moment. One final point of clarity, um, a question. Were all the injections done by the same surgeon? No. Uh, so um, so we have uh, four foot and ankle consultants uh, at the time uh, that this was done. Uh, we all entered in. So um, they were done across the spectrum of four, either by us or by the fellow. And presumably all following the same procedure. The yes. same. Yeah, we all use the same um, equipment and all used at the point of maximal tenderness. Okay. Tim, thank you very much for sharing with us this evening. 
Um, I'll now hand over to my co-chair, Sarah Johnston-Lynn, who will introduce the second half of the evening and guide us through that. And uh, I hope very much that we've solved the uh, IT problems with the, with the sound on the next presentation. Over to you, Sarah. Hi, good evening. Um, so now we're going to be moving on to the second paper of the evening, which will be Anil Halder, who's kindly put together a presentation on the path to randomized placebo controlled trial, looking at platelet rich plasma in the treatment of patients who have non operatively treated acute Achilles tendon ruptures. So I think we're going to go now to Anil's presentation. Good evening. My name is Anil Halder, uh, and I'm the current post-CCT Foot and Ankle Fellow at the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital in Stanmore. Uh, thank you to BOFAS, and thank you to Mr. Ritchie for having me this evening uh, to present the following paper. The paper that I'm presenting is titled Platelet-Rich Plasma Injection for Acute Achilles Tendon Rupture, the Path to Randomized Placebo-Controlled Superiority Trial. Uh, this paper was published by Keen and Al-Susu et al., in the British Medical Journal in 2019. So as we've heard, uh, PRP has shown positive cellular and physiological effects in various contexts in the laboratory. Uh, and PRP is already extensively used in the sports medicine and orthopedic community with the market growing year on year and it already being a multi-million pound and dollar industry. And despite numerous clinical trials suggesting that PRP is a positive thing, uh, its efficacy in patients remains uncertain and the jury is still out about its use. The Achilles tendon, as you all know, is the most commonly ruptured tendon in humans and the Achilles therefore offers an optical clinical model for assessing the efficacy of PRP in tendon injuries as it's a common presentation and relatively easy to diagnose clinically compared to other tendon injuries. The aim of this study was therefore to determine the clinical efficacy of a standardized preparation of PRP in treating acute, non-surgically managed ruptures of the Achilles tendon in a randomized controlled trial. And the group's hypothesis was that PRP may accelerate tendon healing and may improve the mechanical properties of healing tissue, resulting in improved muscle tendon function in participants. Now, the methods are that this trial was designed as a randomized, placebo-controlled, multi-center, two-arm, parallel group superiority trial. And whilst that is a mouthful, that is actually a very good summary of exactly what this trial was. The multi-center aspect of it is that it was conducted across 19 UK hospitals, and participants were randomized in a one-to-one -one ratio to receive either a PRP injection or placebo. And these were the two arms of the study, followed over time. The inclusion criteria can be seen here uh, and patients were all adults over the age of 18. Uh, the clinical diagnosis of an acute mid-substance Achilles tendon rupture was necessary for patients to be included in this study and that acute uh, aspect had to be within 12 days of the injury where patients were being treated. Patients had to be independently mobile, pre-injury uh, and all patients had to be managed non-surgically in a cast, splint, or boot. Therefore, anyone where surgical intervention was planned were excluded from the study. Other exclusion criteria, as you can see, are patients where an insertion or muscular tendinous junction tear were suspected, uh, and also in patients who had major le leg injuries or deformities, uh, diabetes, platelet or hematological disorders, corticosteroid use, or treatment dose anticoagulation, which could be confounding factors, were also excluded. The interventions received by these patients were all patients had blood taken. In the PRP group, 55 mils of blood was withdrawn from the patient, and in the placebo group, five mils of blood was taken. In both groups, this five mils of blood were sent for whole blood analysis, and the 50 mils of blood in the PRP group were used to produce an eight mil leukocyte and PRP concentrate. All participants then lay face down on a treatment table and a clinician, so either a surgeon or specialist physiotherapist, would then palpate the tendon, inject local anesthetic and inject either PRP or place a placebo needle in the center of the tendon gap. In the placebo group, 
The same size needle as the PRP needle was inserted into the tendon gap, but this needle was only held in place for the duration that would be expected to perform a PRP injection, but no solution was actually injected. Now, after the injection or the uh, placebo, all patients then went on to have local non-surgical ruptured Achilles tendon management as per the protocol for that unit. Now, the outcomes and assessments can be seen here. And the primary outcome measure in this study was to assess muscle tendon function. And this was measured by the validated heel rise endurance test. And you can see here a picture on the screen uh, or from the, from the paper itself demonstrating the heel rise endurance test. And you can see that the apparatus here is attached to the patient. And this is used to perform this validated uh, outcome measure. Secondary outcomes were patient reported outcome measures, pain scores, and adverse events were also monitored. Now, moving on to the results. Well, patients were recruited from July 2015 to September 2017. And remember, this, patient, this paper was published in 2019. The average age of patients in the study was 46, and one quarter of patients were female. The total number of patients included was 230. However, only 201 of these patients were included in the final study, as these were the 87% of patients who had full data available for analysis. This slide summarizes the results and the main findings from this study. And really, there was no difference in muscle tendon function identified between the PRP and the placebo group. With reference to secondary outcome measures, there was also no significant difference in the clinical assessments, pain scores, nor patient reported outcome measures at four, seven, 13, or 24 week follow up in these patients. Similarly, the re rupture and DVT rates were comparable between the PRP and placebo group, as you can see at the bottom of the screen there. And this uh, table here from the paper shows in a bit more detail the different outcomes that were looked at and also the lack of significance with the p-values when comparing the PRP group and the placebo group. You can see here the heel rise endurance test, the Achilles tendon rupture score, patient-specific functional scores, and an SF12 score. And none of these p-values reach statistical significance apart from a 0.04 value of the mental component of the SF12 score at, 12, 20, at 24 weeks. So really, there is no significant difference demonstrating the study between PRP and placebo in Achilles tendon ruptures. Therefore, in the discussion, this paper found that there was no evidence that PRP improved muscle tendon function, PROMS, nor quality of life in acute Achilles tendon ruptures. The hypothesized benefits of PRP seen in lab-based studies did not therefore translate into a detectable patient benefit. And the group felt that the PATH2 trial highlights that the use of PRP preparations in soft tissue injury must be questioned unless supported by robust evidence indicating positive outcomes. So what critique can be aimed at this paper? Well, as with all papers, there of course are some limitations. And one limitation that may be uh, suggested in this paper is that blinding may have been affected by the fact that different volumes of blood were taken from the different groups. So in the PRP group, 55 mils of blood were taken from patients versus the only five mils of blood taken from those in the placebo group. And this could therefore have affected blinding to some extent. However, it's unclear as to whether patients would know how much blood is being taken from other patients and therefore which group that would lead them to be in. One other limitation can be uh, that as this was a multi-center trial across 19 centers, that can introduce variability and a variation in practice. For example, if different units had a different period and type of immobilization or different weight bearing statuses or even different access to physiotherapy, that could have been confounding, those could have been confounding factors in the overall result. But that being said, I think the strength of this paper significantly outweigh any limitations. 
It was the largest trial to investigate the efficacy of PRP in acute tendon ruptures. And it was UK based and generalizable to the population that we are likely to be treating. They selected an appropriate variety of validated outcome scores, including clinical assessment and patient reported outcome measures. And the PRP concentrate in patients was actually also analyzed, indicating that a suitable standard of PRP was achieved in these patients with this uh, process uh, that was used for creating PRP or extracting PRP in this study. Overall, I think this study had a very robust and reliable methodology. So in conclusion, this study found that there was no evidence that PRP injections affected objective muscle tendon uh, function, patient reported function, or quality of life compared to placebo after Achilles tendon ruptures. The group found that PRP offered no patient benefit in patients with acute Achilles tendon ruptures. Thank you for your time. So many thanks to Anil there for um, a really comprehensive summary of the path to paper. And we're going to move on now to introduce Joel Susu, who's going to give us his reflections and maybe some updates um, and thoughts on the paper. Thank you very much for inviting me to um, talk about this paper and maybe the second paper that we produced on the two years follow-up. Um, and thanks, Anil, for um, presenting the paper. I can, I'm not sure if you can see on the screen, this is a, this is a platelet. And, and we all think platelets are the tiny little cells, but actually when it activated, it, it explodes. It becomes about 10 times the, the and it produces the dense granules that then migrate to the surface. Uh, and produce around 1,100 bioactive proteins. And that's where the interest in PRP is, is coming or becoming more relevant recently. Um, the, it's important to recognize not all PRP is PRP. So um, we've done a little study on all the devices in the market uh, that depends on different technology, whether it's floating boy, uh, cell saver uh, system, uh, computer aided standardized infusion, ways of separating platelets from the rest of the blood um, and they they have different yields uh, as you can see it could be one 1.6 or up to six or seven uh, we use this device which is the uh, prp uh, a tear site magellan device that produces around five times the value of yield and it's a buffy coat based system with automatic automatic filtration so no hand involved, uh, no aspiration. It gives you a syringe full of the PRB. Uh, it's also, also worth mentioning, it's a leukocyte rich platelet rich plasma. Uh, so when you compare that to other products which have leukocyte depleted rich plasma or uh, poor uh, leukocytes. And, and this is the device in the picture here. Um, and that's what the product uh, you will see. Of the primary outcome for the main paper was uh, the heat endurance test, and Anil mentioned that uh, we, we asked patients to stand in the box and we measure the distance, then we take the weight and height and measure the calories and compare it to the other side. So you're actually measuring the work per site or per leg and observe that over the period. And uh, no surprise, there was no difference. So this is now, the first paper was on the 24 weeks, and now we had two years follow up is still no effect whatsoever uh, in all of the outcome measures that we presented, including SF SF12, and they're all flat. Um, and looking at the blood cells again, it's it's uh, we've we've achieved what we need to achieve, and we know that we injected five times the value. That's just to make it clear to everyone. Um, so just to confirm the results, um, there was no difference in the main outcome at two years. But there's also no difference in uh, at two years in ATRS, SF12, BSFS, uh, pain diary, uh, heel rise endurance death, and correlation. But there was one difference that we found, or one significant result. Uh, it's not coming. 
the blinding test was successful. So we actually successfully blinded the patient. So with regards to the uh, point mentioned earlier, whether the patient can see or not, we have done the Jameson Bang blinding test on all the patients and assessed, and that showed we have successfully blinded all patients. None of them were able to guess what treatment they had. Uh, so I'd like to wrap it at this and um, happy to take any comments. That's the team that uh, produced the paper and thanks to center collaborators around the country. Thank you for that, Joe. And um, we do have some questions. So the first of those was asking about um, was there anything that you did to standardize the other sort of non-trial treatments, the non-surgical treatments that were done in different sites, or was it purely pragmatic? Um, that is really important question, and, and thanks for that. It, we did. We did standardize the rehabilitation protocol in a pragmatic way. And what that means, we gave every physiotherapy department or every department which contributed in the 19 centers milestones to meet for the patients. We did not specifically tell them what to do because that's not pragmatic and it would not work. But we said at week so and so the patient should be able to reach that milestone. Um, and at the 12 week they should reach that milestone. And that was based on a survey we done across the country for what we will do post Achilles tendon rupture. So we did our best to standardize and, and that part was part of the training protocol for the trial as well. Center. And we've had another sort of question stroke comment that um, you've obviously performed a large, you know, well-constructed randomized controlled trial. And yet there are still sort of enthusiasts in PRP doing this treatment. Is it time that we sort of, we as a group, maybe BOFAS or whether NICE has another look at it, do you think to kind of say really, you know, there is no benefit to this treatment? Do you think you've, we've kind of had the final word on it? Um, it, it's important which product we, we inject and use in any trial or study. Um, so we've used leukocyte, platelet rich plasma uh, uh, classification or, or product. There are other products in the markets that are slightly different and have variable uh, biological products in them. And I don't think we've reached a conclusion. We don't know. Uh, sadly, many studies. Uh, do not report what platelets they've injected. They might say the device, but has that actually Because the variability in the initial blood product may lead to variability in the outcome or the product that you injected. So we don't know if there is any correlation between that and the outcome. We have looked at all the cells analysis and cor correlated that with the outcome and there was no link. What whether you receive high platelets or low platelets, high leukocytes or low leukocytes, it didn't make a difference. Um, I think what NICE need to do is recommend that all studies should have an analysis of what's been injected. For analyzing the device outcome and during the study, making sure we know what's been injected or used. There might be a product that works, but we don't know so far. I think it's a really important point because after um, the Delphi study in 2017, which was published in the American JBGS, talking about minimum requirements for reporting for biologics, you know, I think your study is great because it, you know, you've analyzed all of the samples, which is a real rarity. So I think it's important to bring that out, how important that is from your study and how difficult it makes it to compare with other studies, which may or may not be similar. Um, one of the other questions is, do you think that the damage to the tendons was um, too severe to show a difference when PRP was injected? And do you have any plans to do a similar study looking at tendinopathies rather than tendon ruptures? Um, we know that tendon ruptures are a different beast to tendinopathy. Um, there might be some changes and there are some uh, studies, especially in the um, in around the elbow with tendinopathy showing shown positive effects. We currently don't have any plan to look into tendinopathy. Um, Rebecca Kearney on, uh, and we, we just need to wait the results. The report's been done, uh, the data's been analyzed as far as I know, and the paper should be coming out soon. So there is a 
to that already. Yeah, that's absolutely great. So I think um, Jit wants to um, just jump in with a question. Did you, Jit, are you off mute? I can be, Sarah. Is that okay? So, Joseph, yes. thank you very much. My question is, um, and if I remember correctly, um, when Keith Willett presented some of this stuff, the experimental study showed that there was a good response to tendon healing with PRP, exactly the bit that you were going to use, uh, particularly on biopsies. Why is that not being borne out in humans? And are we sort of, you know, a lot of the stuff that we do or plan to do, we start with experimental studies thinking they will get a good response in the humans similar to what we do in the, in the tissues and the uh, animals. Any thoughts? Uh, thanks, Jit. It's really disappointing not to find positive results because that was based on my uh, PhD study. And, uh, and we did you know four years of experimental studies and only to find that it doesn't work clinically. It's very disheartening, but uh, the reality is what we study in the lab is, is very different. When we take some tenocytes, put them in a vitro dish with some platelets, uh, you only have two factors playing with each other. Uh, you know, the platelets producing the growth factors, tenocytes migrate towards them, great. But does that translate into clinical, clinical efficacy? And that's what this study shows, it didn't. Uh, it could be multiple factors to play here. The, the products it is the same that we used in the lab, but uh, the environment where the product is injecting is different. The response might have been so severe and acute that a uh, platelets injection may not have had any effects anyway um, in comparison to other, other sites or other chronic conditions. So it's, it's really difficult. But until we've done this study, we did not know. We went in thinking we have a product or a PRP that would work and didn't translate into the pragmatic setting at all. And that's the whole point of doing studies like this. It's just you want to make sure there's clinical efficacy. Otherwise, it's pointless. It's a waste of money. 200, 250 pound per pop is, is a lot of money. So we've Thank got you. another couple of questions from um, the Q&A. So one of the questions is, do you think it makes a difference um, what the character of the tear is, whether it's transverse or longitudinal, and whether you think it would make a difference um, when you add PRP? Um, I, don't, I don't think it will make a difference. We um, went for uh, full substance tears. Uh, partial tears were excluded. Uh, Musculotendinous junction uh, tears were excluded. Uh, but considering that complete mid-substance tear is the worst and the going to be given the worst outcome, you would expect, if there's an effect, to detect it in the worst case, because that's when you're going to get that kick-starting healing process and accelerate it. So if that didn't happen in that condition, I don't think it will, it will do anything to partial or muscular tendons junction tears anyway. Another question was, had you considered or, or could you use PRP in re-ruptures, do you think? That's that's very interesting. I think re-ruptures are, are are a completely different beast. The um, uh, the healing process already started and failed. The environment where the cells are is completely different to when you just have hematoma. Um, I I don't know is the is the real answer for this. We had only two ruptures in the whole of the study, so we can't really repeat it on these patients. Uh, it would be meaning meaningless. Um, but I think a study looking into that, you're probably looking at about 5,000 patients of TA ruptures to get the enough number of ruptures to treat them with PRP and reach a conclusion. So it's almost impossible trial to do. <laughs> yeah. Um, and another question is, did you look at gap size um, before with any imaging before you um, randomized patients? <clears throat> um, no, we didn't. For the pilot study, for path one, we did. We used ultrasound scan and we measured the gap. We identified it. But that was a small scale pilot study to one center. Being a pragmatic study across 19 centers, we could not ask all centers to do ultrasound scan. We just had to be pragmatic. Some centers do, some centers don't. Um, and if they did, fine, great. That's their way of identifying the gap. If it's just clinical decision, 
again, that's acceptable. So it was a clinical decision. Uh, some centers used that ultrasound, some didn't, but we did not recommend that as part of the trial. And I don't think it makes a difference in a complete substance. Uh, it's, it's, it's usually clinical assessment is more than enough. That's great. Thanks, Joe. Um, I think we've come to the end of our questions for Joe, unless anyone else had anything um, quickly to add. So um, I want to say thank you very much um, for your excellent paper and your excellent updates that you've given. Um, James, did you have any other, um, anything else you wanted to come in um, and summarise? No, I think we've had a very elegant uh, discussion on, on the topic, and I'd certainly think, thank Joe for participating in giving his time this evening. Uh, I know it wasn't your, your your top choice of evening to do it, so thank you very much. <laughs> I had much appreciated. Um, <clears throat> I think it's been a very comprehensive discussion. I'd also thank uh, Tim for his thoughts on plantar fasciitis. Uh, we have one further comment on plantar fasciitis from our eminent um, colleague, Mr. Matthew Solon, which is don't forget the tight gastronemius. Okay, chaps, don't forget that. Um, but otherwise, I just just remains me to thank the fellows for presenting the paper summaries and Sarah for chairing the second half. 